The reason we hit peak globalization, though, last summer is peak oil per capita. That occurred in 1979 at the height of the, oil, of the auto age. If you distributed all the oil reserves that we knew we had then to every human being living at that point, that's the most you could get per person. We found more oil in the last 30 years, but population rose quicker. So you see where I'm going. When China and India made a massive bid to bring one-third of the human race into a second industrial revolution structure, the demand pressure on the oil was so great that after 80 a barrel, inflation goes up at 147 a barrel, the engine turns off. Now, you notice the economy is regrowing now slightly because we're replenishing inventories. But as soon as we began to do it, oil shot back to 80 a barrel. What I'm telling you, it's a rubber band. Every time we try to get up, we're going to short circuit at 147 and go right back down. This is the reality we have to understand. This is the earthquake. The financial meltdown is the echo. Finally, the real-time impacts of climate change on agriculture. How bad is it? It is much worse than the public's being told you know how bad it is because you're spending every day on it. I was in France, Paris with President Chirac in 2007 when the fourth assessment report of the UN panel on climate change was put out in Paris. We had world leaders there, and I have to say, we were all taken aback because we had all gotten it wrong. I'm going to tell you I got it wrong. My colleagues got it wrong. There may be a few of you very old people who suffered through a book I wrote in 1980 called Entropy. It was the first book on climate change. I, had to, I have to tell you now, I got it wrong. We all continued to underestimate the acceleration of climate change because we couldn't imagine the feedback loops until after they happened. It's the feedback loops that keep coming back to kick us. How bad is the acceleration? If you look at the 2001 UN report and compare it to 2007, it's terrifying. Because in 2001, we didn't have a lot of the feedbacks in yet. The models showed that our great glaciers on the mountain ranges would disappear sometime in the 22nd century, giving us a little time. 2007 UN climate change report, the glaciers are disappearing in real time across the world from the Alps to the Andes in the first 40 years of this century and we're going to lose up to 60% of those glaciers by mid-century. This isn't about skiing at Davos. One out of every six human beings relies totally on those glaciers every year for their irrigation, sanitation, and hygiene, everything. How do we repopulate one-sixth of the world's population in 40 years? And that's just the beginning of the feedback loops. The third report in 2007 of the UN said, look to the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Stream, 22nd century, temperature of the Earth heats, the Gulf Stream heats, more Category 3s, Category 4s, Category 5 hurricanes. The fourth report, 2007, Katrina and Rita, Gustav and Ike put us in real-time climate change. We doubled the intensity of hurricanes in 30 years. We're here, 100 years earlier. It's not academic. If you have friends or relatives who live in the United States from Florida to Texas, on the opening day of hurricane season and from then on, they turn on the weather channel every single morning and they cross their fingers that another hurricane is not brewing in the Atlantic. Those four hurricanes alone cost us over $100 billion and this is just 2009. What about 2010, 2020, 2030? And finally, of course, the third report said look to the Arctic early warning system, 22nd century, maybe ocean wa waters all open. The fourth report, 2007, the polar bears are drowning now in real time. And we've had open waters in August for three years in the Arctic. You can kayak into the Arctic in August. That's just amazing. So how bad is it? The UN report in 2007 says three degrees Celsius rise is a middle scenario, could go higher. Now that's looking optimistic, I'm sure, to folks in this room. But to put this in perspective, if we only go up three degrees in the century of you and your children, that takes us back to the temperature on this little planet three million years ago in the Pliocene. Different flora and fauna, but here's the most important thing to spread to your friends. It's all about the hydrological cycle. That's what's never explained. It's all about the cycle of water. For every one degree Celsius that the planet's temperature rises, 
the atmosphere absorbs 7% more precipitation and sucks it up from the ground. That means much more violent uh, downburst of rain, more drought, and longer periods without rain. The entire ecosystems of this biosphere developed over eons of time for a different hydrological cycle. They can't catch up to this. Three degrees, that's a big change in the water. If we go two to three degrees, now I advise the European Union, everyone's going to Copenhagen this next week, and we are hoping that the world would mitigate to uh, CO2 so we only go up two degrees. And nobody wants to play, including the Obama administration. Understand, I voted for President Obama, but please understand what he and his political party have done. In the U.S. House of Representatives, and this party did it, and he did not say a thing. They passed a bill in the House that would cut global warming emissions by 17 percent by 2020. And that doesn't sound bad, because the EU is 20 percent cut. But the U.S. figures are based on 2005 emissions. The EU is based on 1990 emissions. So the real cut in the U.S. under President Obama's leadership, he didn't even argue it out, is a 4 percent cut in global warming gases by 2020. My friends, that's lower than developing countries. He needs to get off the world stage or he needs to stand up and be counted. So, if we go two to three degrees, our UN climate panel report says we risk between, on the low end, 25% of all plant and animal species extinct. On the high end, 70% of all the life on this planet that's so far been assessed extinct, maybe by the end of the century. <laughs> that's a wipeout. We've only had five waves of biological extinction in the last 450 million years in the geological record, four wipeouts. Every time we had a mass extinction, it took 10 million years to recover the biodiversity we lost. We're not grasping this. It's maybe too enormous. It's eluding us. It's not even the top 20 issues in American public. The EU is an exception in terms of public opinion. But the EU also is going to have to be the flagship. If the EU is not the flagship, I don't know where it's going to come from. It's about feedback loops. We had permafrost in the fourth assessment report in Siberia, but there were no studies in, so it wasn't in the models. Just to give you one feedback, if you travel to Siberia, it's permafrost across the ground in an area the size of France and Germany. And underneath that permafrost is a ticking time bomb. It's the entire carbon deposits of the pre-ice age because Siberia was a teeming grassland full of animal and plant life. And when the temperature tips on the planet, it tips really quick. There's a tipping point on the biochemistry. For example, between the last ice age and today, one-third of all the temperature change we've had occurred in 10 years during the Younger Dryas period, massive extinction. So in Siberia, that happened too. Tipping point in the temperature, plant and animal life captured under the frost. And now the permafrost is melting, and there's more carbon down there under the ground than in all the tropical rainforest put together in the world, and it's coming up CO2. And during, at the lake beds, it's coming up methane, which is 22 times more potent than CO2. And the journal Nature a few months ago said, in the last 12 months since they reported the ice melt, it's accelerating six times faster than 12 months ago. This is just one feedback loop. 